that. We're all a little busy. Yeah. Okay. Sally, do you want to do the introduction? Ah. Uh, because you're the one who found Margaret. I know who she is. <laughs> if I've seen the video, but but beyond that, I yeah. I can probably tell you what I think is your history. Were you a pediatrician and you got really disgusted with? with the um, way it works and how difficult it is to be a doctor. There you go. Yep, well, I've seen the video and I remembered it. <laughs> it's probably been a year. <laughs> yeah. And you look like yourself, so. Oh, good. Okay. I'm trying to go without my glasses, but I really literally can't see anything without them. So. I'm just refusing to look at my picture up there in the corner. <laughs> Glasses from here for distance, not for close up. So. Welcome, everybody. Oh, so Hi there. You. Oh. Um, if you want to be muted, uh, there's in the upper upper right hand corner of your photograph that says mute and unmute. So I will mute myself and we'll let Margaret go from here. Okay, um, so was, I was going to do a presentation. Sally, is there a way that you can pull that up? And yes. Um, screen share that. And I want to thank you for inviting me. Really oh, appreciate sure. It. Glad to have you. Thank you. You've been working on this issue all the way through and so well. So for a little well. while. Yeah, thanks. So we can um, just. Okay, so. Um, uh, start slideshow. You. Yeah, got it up. Okay. Yeah, that looks okay. great. So um, you'll probably recognize that quote down there uh, from Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. Um, so I thought that's a good place to start. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so what is health injustice? I think it's um, really interesting that I think maybe because people in the United States, you know, we're not like the European countries where we're surrounded by so many countries and it's easy to travel to them. We're kind of isolated here. And so um, people don't even seem to recognize in the US often that we are experiencing health injustice um, and that we have rights that are being violated. But this is Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that you're probably familiar with. It was signed in 1948, and Eleanor Roosevelt played a big role in, in creating it. And it says everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for health and well being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. Um, and so, we, on paper, we have this right to health care, we just don't have it in lived reality. So, let's go to the next slide. And part of this is kind of an accident of history. I mean, there's a lot of health history. We could do a whole hours on health history, but I think one of the turning points was after World War II, which also was around the same time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was created. In the European countries, many European countries experienced such devastation that they had to rebuild themselves. And part of that rebuilding was that they created social systems that actually treated you know, basic necessities as public goods and created systems that, you know, made sure that people had access to health care and education and, you know, jobs and things like that. In the United States, during World War II, we had a uh, freeze on, on wages. And so businesses started offering benefits in order to attract employees. And that kind of began this relationship between health insurance and employment, and it really took off after that. And so now we have the system in the US where the majority of people get their health insurance through their employer, and if they have a health problem and they can't work, then they can lose it. So it's not, not a very good setup, and it wasn't intentional. It wasn't meant to be that way. Let's go to the next slide. Here. So these are the um, principles of human rights, and these can really be used, um, you know, in many of the issues that we work on, but there's kind of five basic principles that we talk about. 
Um, one is universality, that every person has, you know, access to whatever the system is, the healthcare system, the education system, that there's equity so that people have what they need in order to have access to that. So, right, equity is, um, you know, if, if a bunch of people need to get over a wall, some people may be able to climb over that wall. Some people may need a ladder to help them climb over and some may need a door to go through. So we each need something to help us get to the other side and that's what equity really is about. Um, transparency means that we know how the system is functioning. Accountability is that we have you know, some way to hold that system accountable if it's not serving our needs. And then participatory means that we have a say in how that system functions. And um, what's interesting is that other countries that have universal systems figured out pretty early on that welfare systems always tend to be poor systems uh, because they're systems for the poor. But that when you put everybody into the same system from the wealthy you know, down to the poorest person, they all have a stake in that system. They have a sense of social solidarity and a need to protect it and make it the best system that it can be. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so how does the United States compare to other countries? This is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Every year they put out excellent um, information comparing the various countries and you can download the slides for free on the internet. But basically what this looks at is a number of different uh, countries that are in the OECD. And it's a little bit blurry, but you know, Australia and Canada are at the top, Czech, Denmark, Finland, goes on down and you'll see the United States is the second from the bottom. We're just above Greece in terms of the percentage of our population that has health insurance coverage of some sort. And the other thing that's really interesting, a way that the United States is an outlier, um, is that if you look at the two different colors, the darker orange represents public coverage. So you can see that the majority of countries at the top have 100% or near 100% coverage, and most of that is public. In many countries, all of it is public. And the United States has a much bigger private. The lighter orange represents private. Um, and so a much bigger part of our coverage is through private health insurances. Does that, is that clear? Do you have any questions about that? Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, and in terms of cost, we are also an outlier in the fact that we spend the most. We spend twice as much as the average OECD country, total you know, spending per person per year. And so if you see the United States compared to the United Kingdom, which has a purely socialized system, a national health service, um, and then Japan and France, which are some of the top systems in the world, Canada, you know, Sweden, we're spending um, more than twice as much as they're spending. And then if you look at the breakdown in our dollars, the yellow represents public dollars and the orange represents uh, private dollars, we're already spending more in public dollars than most of these countries are spending, and yet we're still not covering everybody. And those public dollars include um, the tax breaks that we give to employers um, for, you know, for offering private insurance. Now we're giving all kinds of assistance for subsidies, um, we're giving assistance for, uh, you know, to help offset the out-of-pocket costs. So in 2016 alone, we spent $300 billion in subsidizing the purchase of private insurance in the United States. Um, so I, I often say that we're paying for a universal system. We're just not getting it. Let's go to the next slide. Um, how do we compare in life expectancy? You can see the United States on the left in yellow has a lower average life expectancy than many of the other countries. Um, a lot of those countries have been seeing their life expectancy rise. And in the United States, for uh, the last two years, we've actually seen our life expectancy decline. And that's the first time that we've seen a decline in our life expectancy since the 1960s. And that was pretty much across the board, all demographics. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, infant mortality, something that I care very much about. This is the number of deaths in the first year of life per thousand live births. And you can see that the United States is higher than other countries in terms of uh, infant mortality. That's an average amount. If you look at certain pockets in the United States, look in the deep south, um, you know, you're going to see rates there that are similar to what we would see in developing nations. So we have very, you know, areas of great inequality and disparities in our country. Let's go to the next slide. 
I think this one is just really striking. It's maternal mortality, the number of deaths per 100,000 births. And you can see that the US on the left there in yellow is way higher than you know, many of these other countries. And again, we don't guarantee you know, that every mother has prenatal care um, and we don't, you know, so that's you know, necessarily gonna translate into unidentified problems um, during pregnancy that can put mother's lives at risk. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and then looking at inequality in this country, I'm sure that many of you are already aware that we are one of the most unequal countries um, you know, for being a developed country. Uh, this looks at the top 1% income share and compares that to many of other countries that have universal healthcare systems. And you can see the US is an outlier. Um, I remember in 2010 when we were going around and saying that 400 people in the United States had the same wealth as the bottom 50%. And I thought that was a really outrageous number that 400 people had the same wealth as the bottom 50%. And this year, that number has gone down to three. Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates have as much wealth as the bottom 50% of people in the United States. So this is just outrageous and um, and it ties in wealth inequality is is very directly tied to a lot of our poor outcomes in what are called indicators of social well-being so there's a book called the spirit level that was written by um, some public health uh, professionals in the united kingdom and they compared countries on their how they did on various aspects of social well-being teen pregnancies violence education and they found that uh, you know the united states was an outlier on many of these and that also you know we have such a great wealth disparity compared to many of the other countries let's go to the next slide um, one of the reasons that you know for our problems in the United States is also that we spend the most. So when it comes to things like drugs or health services, we have much higher um, prices than they do in other countries. So we have this wealth inequality, and then we don't have a system that's actually able to control the, the costs of the health services that we need. We leave you know the pharmaceuticals are are really more and more left to the whims of the market so that you have the Martin Shkreli's and, and the company that I think it's called Mylon that raised the price of epinephrine pens that people depend on when they have allergies. And they do that not based on anything about you know, the need for, uh, for you know, research or development or production, it's really based on what they think they can get away with. And, um, and so people are going without because of these high prices. Let's go to the next slide. So let's look at where the United States um, stands right now. Um, we have 32 million people who are without insurance. And this slide looks at kind of the trends in um, coverage going back to the 1940s. And um, there's a big dip, or I'm sorry, this is the number of uninsured um, in the graph. And the big dip in that in 1965 when we passed Medicaid and Medicare. And we did that in a year. We you know, covered those people in a year with, it was a brand new system and we didn't have computers. Literally there were little cards that people filled out. You put your name and you checked off, you know, whether you wanted Medicare or not. And I think you got uh, $3 uh, taken out through your taxes to help cover uh, the cost of Medicare. Um, so when people say, you know, this is too difficult, we can't do it. Well, we did it. Um, one thing that's really interesting about the history of Medicare and Medicaid is that it was initially supposed to be one system that could then be expanded, but there was a uh, Southern Dixiecrat, his name is Wilbur Mills, he was the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, and he was uh, a racist, and he put a poison pill into the Medicare and Medicaid bill, uh, something that he called, or it was called the three-layer cake, which split Medicare into part A and part B, and then made Medicaid separate. It made uh, Medicare a federal system and Medicaid a state-based system. So it made it almost impossible to take those systems and combine them into one universal public health insurance. Um, we saw then over the following years, especially in the 1980s, um, in the 1974 was when President Nixon uh, signed the Health Maintenance Organization Act that allowed companies to profit off of our healthcare system. And then Reagan really accelerated that through the 1980s. 1990s, we had the HMOs coming in and you really started to see this rise in the cost of health insurance and the number of people who were going without 
it's hit a real crisis in 2008, um, you know, with the financial crisis that we had. And then the Affordable Care Act helped to bring that down. But the Affordable Care Act um, was not a universal health care system, even though it was called that. And we knew that at best it would be able to cover half of the uninsured and that it wouldn't be a lasting uh, coverage. And so we're starting to see that plateau um, that was predicted, and that's the yellow part on the right side of the graph. Um, last year, um, 3.2 million more people became uninsured. And so we can expect it to kind of plateau or, or rise over the next few years. And that's the same thing we've seen at the state level when they've tried similar reforms. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a study that uh, doctors Wohandler and Himmelstein do every year looking at the number of excess deaths. And so in 2016, they estimated that just due to being uninsured, we had 36,530 excess deaths and they break that out by state. Um, we've used these numbers when um, we were pushing Congress back in 2009 to, to you know, look at single payer. We actually created chalk outlines of dead bodies and we put the number of excess deaths in each state and we uh, brought them into members of Congress's offices and dropped them on the floor for a kind of a graphic display of what's actually going on in their state. So these numbers are, can be handy to have. Let's go to the next slide. Um, but in addition to people being uninsured in the United States, we have a growing trend of people who are underinsured. So there was this idea that the you know, market-based health insurance people came up with um, called consumer-directed health plans and high deductible health plans and the health savings account, which is really a financial tool that makes more money for Wall Street. And, um, and so they came up with this concept that people have to have skin in the game and that if you if you, um, if you have to pay up front for your care, you'll be a better consumer of care and, um, and you won't you know, be using so many services. When in reality, I didn't put the slides in, but the United States, we use fewer health services than people do in other countries. We see the doctor less, spend less time in the hospital um, than they do in other countries. And so we're seeing, uh, this only goes up to 2013, but the trend is continuing that kind of, what we used to have as you know comprehensive health insurance coverage is becoming now it's called a Cadillac thing and, it, and it's becoming a thing of the past and and more and more people are getting this skimpy coverage and we'll see what happens when they do that let's go to the next slide uh, oh but just you know so in addition to having higher out-of-pocket costs in the form of co-pays and deductibles um, people in the United States, you know, our, our incomes have stagnated. And so this looks at the population broken down into the bottom 20%, the next 20%, and so on. And you can see that those bottom, you know, uh, percent, you know, percentiles, um, wages have basically uh, stagnated since the 1970s. And so healthcare costs are going up, but wages are staying low. What do people do? Um, let's go to the next slide. Well, basically, they can't afford health care. So this looked at non-poor families and found that um, you can see the blue is all families and the yellow is families without health insurance, um, that looking at the average kind of amount of deductible or out-of-pocket limit that people have to pay before their health insurance kicks in, a lot of people don't, even people with insurance, don't have that money in the bank. So they may have a health insurance product that they've bought, but they can't actually you know, pay the out-of-pocket costs that they need to pay before it would kick in and cover them. Um, so this is a problem, and, and let's go to the next slide. We'll see what happens when people have these out-of-pocket costs. And this is based on the RAND. This is a very famous study done by RAND uh, Corporation, and it kind of blows away that whole myth that people need skin in the game. What they found is that the more people have to pay up front for healthcare, the less health care they use. So this just looked at um, children between the ages of zero to four and then five to 13 and how many had a visit to the doctor within the past year and what their out-of-pocket costs were for that visit. And you can see that, um, you know, people, children, when their care was free, 95% of young, you know, toddlers and infants were going to the doctor, 85% of older children were going to the doctor every year. But as as the amount of pocket money they have to spend out of pocket goes up, fewer children see the doctor. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
And this was a really interesting situation where a company lost its Cadillac, you know, its comprehensive coverage and switched to one of these high deductible uh, health plans. They have 150,000 employees. So they were able to look at utilization of healthcare services before that switch when they had the comprehensive coverage and then when they had to pay out of pocket. And they found that pretty much across the board, their um, employees were using fewer services. So looking at, you know, how many were seeking preventive care, you know, just going to the doctor when they needed to, getting me mental health, going to the ER, you know, and so on, they found a reduction in use. And what was also interesting from that RAND study is that they found that people, no matter how well educated you are, uh, people are not able to discriminate between necessary care and unnecessary care. And so people are just as likely to forego necessary care as they are unnecessary care. What happens when you go without necessary care is that you risk your condition getting worse. It may become more expensive to treat. You may have a worse outcome. Um, so, you know, this is in the end, it just kind of bites us. I think about high blood pressure in the, in the United States. We're seeing people in their 40s having strokes and kidney disease from uncontrolled high blood pressure. And then of course, we'll take care of you. You know, once you have a stroke and you can't work, you can get disability. Um, you know, not, I say we take care of you, you don't really do a very good job even of that. Um, if you need dialysis, Medicare will cover that. But think about the lost lives and the stress on families just from not taking care of people with high blood pressure. And um, one thing that was interesting about this study that they found is that there was no evidence that the employees were actually shopping around for better care that you know you think about it when you need care you need it and it's not like you're at the hospital and you say oh wait a second don't give me that let me call and see if i can get it cheaper somewhere else it just doesn't work that way um, let's go to the next uh, slide um, another thing that really sets the united states apart from other countries is the number of people or, or, the, or even just the fact that people go into bankruptcy because of medical illness. Um, you may have seen Michael Moore's movie Sicko many years ago, and I think he asked in every country that he went to how many people go bankrupt from medical illness, and people just looked at him like he was crazy. Um, this was a study done in 2009 um, that looked at you know, the causes of personal bankruptcy and found that medical illness uh, caused the majority of personal bankruptcies back then it was 62%. But what was interesting is that almost 80% of people who went bankrupt from an illness had some form of insurance at the onset of that illness. So that even that was not protective for people. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we have a lot of health disparities in the United States, um, mostly segregated by race, but also by income and so you can see life expectancy at birth uh, this is based on 2015 data if um if you're you know white 79 years if you're black 75 years and in where i live in baltimore city my daughter did a project for as a high school student where she looked at the life expectancies for the various neighborhoods in baltimore and she mapped them out and then she connected them with the average life expectancy of another country um, and, you know, so we had third world level in some of our neighborhoods, life expectancies, uh, 20 year differences between the wealthy neighborhoods and the lower income neighborhoods in Baltimore City. Let's go to the next slide. And so, you know, inequality factors in if you don't have, you know, again, it, we have a system where you only get as much care as you can pay for. So if you don't have the money to pay for it, you're not going to get the care. So this looks at, um, at you know median wealth of households and found that um, blacks with college have less wealth than white people who who dropped out of high school um, and this is generations right generations of wealth that has been stolen from black families because they couldn't get uh, you know mortgages to buy a home and homes are a huge way that we pass on wealth in our society. They couldn't get business loans to start their businesses, you know, just all forms of discrimination that have resulted in generations of wealth inequality. Uh, let's go to the next slide. But what's really interesting is that 
when people are then put into a single payer healthcare system, and we have two kind of different single payer healthcare systems in the United States, the VA system and our traditional Medicare or original Medicare, um, that the disparities actually disappear. So this was a study looking at over 3 million veterans in the veterans health system and looking at health outcomes for uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease. And it found, so if the number is less than one, it means that they did better. So for blacks in the VA system, a single payer system, they had lower mortality rates than whites, fewer, uh, you know, fewer heart attacks and fewer strokes. And we see this also with uh, Medicare. Uh, once a person gets into Medicare, then you start to see the gaps, the health disparities start to disappear in the older populations. All right, let's go to the next slide. So what can we say about our current healthcare system? It's a very fragmented healthcare system. We have public and private insurances, hundreds of different types of private insurances. Um, some are at the state level, some are at the federal level. Since the Affordable Care Act, we've seen a real acceleration of privatization and consolidation. So, um, you know, the family doctor, the individual doctor, that's going away. Um, and you're just seeing these huge, you know, conglomerates uh, forming. I actually was called to meet with a doctor today in, ba in earlier today in Baltimore because uh, he's being forced out of his practice by a, it's actually a nonprofit healthcare system in Maryland that owns both facilities and they have their own health insurances. And he sees mostly Medicaid and Medicare patients. And because they don't want him around, they want his office. Uh, they're just pulled back and said, for no reason, we're dropping you. And, and most of his patients have Medicaid and Medicare through this, through this company. And so he's in crisis right now because of that. And that's not an unusual story. I hear it from other doctors all the time. Um, we have a tiered system. Legally, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act was to create a legalized tiered system in the United States. So people get insurance based on what they can afford, platinum, gold, silver, or bronze plans, or if they can't afford those, they might get a catastrophic plan. Um, our, in our health system, profit is the bottom line, not health. And the basic solutions that we've seen, you know, members of Congress is basically either throwing more, more money at the system. So last fall, the Democrats were talking about, you know, let's give health insurance companies more subsidies. Let's give them tax breaks if they'll come back into areas that they dropped out of. Um, the Republicans' response is let's just cut public insurance. Um, and so there's all sorts of things going on right now uh, with waivers for Medicaid in a number of states that would make it uh, more difficult for people to stay on Medicaid. And of course, uh, there's been a long-term agenda to privatize, further privatize Medicare. Medicaid and Medicare are already fairly privatized. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so I look at the United States healthcare system, which is really a hodgepodge. It's kind of an accident of history as a unique experiment in using a market-based healthcare system. And if it was actually being treated as an experiment, we would have had to stop it decades ago just for ethical purposes. Um, it's a very expensive system. We have relatively poor outcomes. We have high health disparities. I didn't talk about it, but um, there have been studies just looking at the number of preventable deaths in the United States and compared to other nations, we always perform the worst. Um, an estimated over 100,000 preventable deaths in the US. We're losing our doctors and that's actually accelerating under the Affordable Care Act because of these new payment mechanisms that they created these pay for performance types of mechanisms. And um, we have you know, uninsured and underinsured people in our country. So let's go to the next slide. So I like this cartoon because the airplane represents our healthcare system. And the guy is saying, we tried every fix the insurance companies allow, but it still won't fly. And that's the reality. There's, we're not gonna be able to fix this airplane until we get the private insurance companies out of our system. They don't offer any benefit. They actually take more money out of the system. They make it more administratively complex and their job is to deny care or charge as much as they can um, and, and to cover people that are healthy, not people that are sick if they can get away with it. So let's go to the next slide. So how do we get it off the ground? I've always said that we need an actual healthcare system that's a system and we need the money to pay for it. And having a national improved Medicare for all uh, 
healthcare system gives us that overall universal system, allows us to get the cost savings to pay for it. Um, Dr. David Barton Smith is really interesting. Uh, he's a health historian, he was at Temple, now he's at Drexel. And he has a book that came out last year called The Power to Heal. And there's a new documentary that just came out based on that book. But he wrote um, that, you know, he, he divides the last hundred years of health kind of of our healthcare system in the United States into five kind of periods. And he shows how each one we compromised instead of doing the two basic things we need, which is a compulsory system. I call it a universal system. He calls it compulsory, a truly a system that has every person in it and then effective gov government oversight of that system to make sure that it's functioning as a public good to benefit people. And so each time there were groups that were fighting for universal health care and they decided to ask, you know, to accept less. And so we've only gone in a worse direction because of that. The proposal that we um, that we advocate for is based on something called the Physicians Working Group proposal. And that was uh, comes out of Physicians for National Health Program. You can read it at pnhp.org. It was updated just a few years ago. Um, let's go to the next slide. So um, what is a national improved Medicare for all? It's a unified risk pool. Every person in the United States who's living here would be in the system from the time they're born until they die. Everybody would contribute based on their ability to pay through a progressive financing mechanism. All medically necessary care is covered. We have to stop practicing this body part where we know we'll cover you, but we won't cover your teeth. We won't cover your ears, whatever, you know, we need to cover the whole person for what, everything that they need. That makes it the simplest. Um, it makes it the most effective. We need simplified administration. A national improved Medicare for all would have one set of transparent rules. Saves a lot of money right there. Plus, you don't have to means test or anything like that. Everybody's in the system. So when they show up for care, they get care. Um, people would have their choice of physician and treatment, something that we don't have right now because the insurance companies can dictate where we go. And we, it allows us to focus on, you know, actual improving our health, making sure that we're doing good preventative care and not having any barriers to care that keep people away from the doctor. So uh, we advocate for no co-pays and no deductibles. Um, and then, oh, I think you can't see it down there, but it would have transparency and accountability to the public. Let's go to the next slide. So the legislation that is our gold standard is HR 676. The official name is the United States National Health Care Act, but we call it the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act. And um, Dr. Marsha Angel, who has this quote, is a former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and she's one of the top health finance experts in the United States. Let's go to the next slide. So um, what would you have under the National Improved Medicare for All, it covers basically everything that people need, preventive, primary, inpatient care, outpatient, emergency care, your medical equipment, long-term care, which is really important. Uh, 10 million people rely on that and can't access the rest of the health system without it. Uh, mental health services, dental, eye care, uh, vision, uh, you know, yeah, it's all in there. So let's go to the next slide. And, oh shoot, I don't know why this is showing up that way. Uh, basically, what this um, slide would show, if you could see the whole slide, is that there have been a number of economic studies done, and if you go to the pnhp.org website, you can find all of them. They've been done at the state level as well as the national level. General Accounting Office has done it. The CBO has, has done studies in the past looking at a single-payer type of system. And basically, they found that the added cost of covering people who are either uninsured or poorly insured and eliminating the upfront cost sharing in the forms of co-pays and deductibles would be more than offset by the, the savings that we can get by being able to bulk purchase, negotiate for fair prices, reduce administrative costs, the ability to root out fraud because you have access to all the information in the health system right now. Uh, we don't. Even... The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, was recently uh, going to try to release the information about the Medicare Advantage plans, how they use our dollars, and the Medicare Advantage plans were able to lobby and prevent that information from being released for study so that people would know how those dollars are being used. But anyway, overall, they found that we would have a little over 4% savings if we went to a single payer system um, each year. Let's go to the next slide. 
So how do we know that a single payer system can be done? Every other industrialized nation kind of has some form of universal system, uh, many of them single payer systems. They all spend less than we do. Many of them spend less than half of what we spend. They have lower death rates, more accountability and higher satisfaction. And no country has ever gone to a single payer system and then said, oh, we hate this and have gone back. In fact, um, many countries fiercely defend their systems. In Canada, they've had an over 80% approval rating for their system, even though they, they don't spend, you know, we could spend a whole lot more than, than they do and have an even higher quality system. Um, but it still is something that they prize. A uh, number of years ago, they voted on who was the most, you know, loved Canadian, and they chose Tommy Douglas, who was the father of their universal health care system. So um, I think the last slide just shows a slide from our action camp um, last week. I guess it was a little over a week ago in Washington, D.C., and these are some of the messages that we had when we were doing our marches. We had a ball and chain. Uh, to represent the burden of the healthcare system that was being pulled by some doctors. And uh, and so there you have it. I'm happy to stop there and then just take any questions that you have. Well, I have a couple of questions. Um, I don't understand why businesses want to uh, continue paying for the insurance, wouldn't they be better off offloading this onto the government? I mean, we talk about being internationally competitive and I, our competitors have this, this advantage of not paying for healthcare and it's a huge part of, of uh, every business's expense. Yeah, and it's why you know some of the auto manufacturers have located in other countries instead of in the US because they were spending, I think there was one uh, report that showed that one company who spent more on health insurance than it spent on steel for its cars. Um, the, those things are starting to change. There's a new group that came out last year called the Business Leaders Transforming Healthcare, which is uh, a single payer organization and they're trying to get more businesses to sign on. Um, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger came out last year saying, you know, we need a single payer system because of the exact things that you said, the drag that it has on our system and our ability to compete internationally. The National Federation of Independent Businesses reports that every year, small and medium businesses say that their biggest burden is healthcare costs. Um, so I think it's a matter of reaching out to businesses and letting them know that there's this solution that exists and explaining to them why um, they would be better off. We have tools on our website, healthoverprofit.org, little business cards that you can take, uh, print, and carry to your local businesses so that they can sign on. There's uh, messaging towards businesses that you can download. Um, so, so that's available. The film Fix It right. uh, starts with the story of a Canadian company thinking about moving to the U.S. and saying, we can't afford that. Right, and Richard Master, who produced Fix It, and then he did after that big pharma market failure, is the one of the people that founded Business Leaders Transforming Healthcare. You you mentioned um, confusing. We went to the doctor's office and were due for a tetanus shot, and they said you may have to pay for this. It's one hundred and thirty dollars, which is a fair amount for a tetanus shot. But what they didn't tell us was if you go to Walgreens, it's free. Mm. So we paid the $130, not knowing better, but next right. time we ask now when we get a shot, should we be going to Walgreens instead? Mm. Mm. The other thing that bothers me is that I really think that um, the insurance industry has nothing on the mafia as far, well, they do have something on the mafia. They, they coerce us to buy insurance because they pay less, and then on med medical drugs, and I assumed this was the case, but didn't really read anything about it till recently, uh, they get rebates on those, which mm -hmm. makes sense because why else would they have a list of pharmaceuticals? It wouldn't matter to them, Take, buy what you want, but they get, they get um, rebates on, on drug yeah. purchases. Yeah, and the health insurance companies have really become uh, monopolies. They've divided, they pretty much divide up the country geographically. Um, there tend to be one or two insurers that, that dominate in each state. And so, you know, this whole idea of the Affordable Care Act was that there would be competition. 
And the insurance companies just, they played that game. They, they didn't, you know, they don't have, uh, they don't compete with each other. And they also are starting to buy up. It's, there's this weird thing happening where, you know, CVS bought Aetna and now Walmart is trying to buy Humana. Um, and Walmart wants to have a doctor in every Walmart. So, you know, doctors are really um, becoming, you know, it used to be a profession. It used to be an art. And now doctors are, are employees just like, you know, every other kind of basic employee and are treated and are supposed to produce. And um, it's all about the money. And, you know, it's just really has changed that whole profession. So we hear a lot about the drug companies and how they're ripping us off, not only the drug companies, but the insurance companies. But how about the doctors in the AMA? Yeah. I mean, I was recently listening to a program about all the obstacles there are in the way of nurse practitioners and other advanced practice nurses, and that the AMA is beginning to lose some of its grip because it's insane right now what you have to go through, depending on what state you are, in order to have a, a nurse who is fully qualified do the work at a dramatically lower cost. Right. So the AMA um, doesn't actually represent the majority of doctors. Only about 15% of physicians are members of the AMA. I and most of the people that I know that are doctors have never belonged to the AMA. It, it is a very much of a special interest organization that that really protects the specialists um you know it doesn't even protect as primary care docs um doesn't represent us um and you know even my own state medical society i was a member for a little while till i realized that all they were about was protecting the doctor's bottom line and didn't really care about public health or the things that we were caring about and trying to fight for um, to actually say, like, well, what can we do at the state level legislatively to actually improve the care of our patients, right? And and that wasn't what our state medical society was interested in, so um, I left it after so that. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering in the context of, for example, um, the, the big bad where I am is a Chevron refinery just up the road a little bit. Mm -hmm. And more and more we're trying to focus on stockholder revolts and that sort of thing. Right. And so my question is looking, for example, at how the National Nurses United have changed dramatically from what the nursing unions used to be. Why aren't doctors doing more to take over the AMA and other organizations that are effective lobbying? It's like yeah. the gun owners doing more about the NRA. The NRA does not represent all gun owners by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. But they have the power to affect uh, legislation. Yeah, you know, I don't have a good answer for that. I know that, you know, um, what I've seen for a while and um, others have commented on too is that doctors in the United States, many of them are uh, are grieving the system that we have. They're, you know, you see all different, you see denial, you see anger, you see bargaining, you see all of that uh, with docs. And, um, you know, docs are usually people that are pretty individualistic, you know, they're at least that's how it used to be. You know, you had your practice and you just wanted to see your patients. And, um, and now this, this whole system just beats, beats the doctors down um, and is forcing them into these kind of corporate situations and, and um, you know, where they don't have any autonomy. It's uh, this whole profession, I think doctors kind of let it happen without recognizing what was going on. I'm really inspired by the younger docs. Um, the medical students that I work with, the new, you know, residents and the new docs, they they get it. They see the bigger picture. Um, it, but it's a very hard system uh, to fight back in. We'll see. I mean, some interesting th things are happening in Maryland with uh, just uh, about a week or so ago, the same company that's trying to, that basically is trying to destroy the practice of this single practitioner that I met with today, fired all of the pediatricians at a local hospital they came in to work and were told you're out like they had no warning no pediatricians because they're not money makers right so i think that um so what happens to people who bring kids there 
<laughs> they exactly. Just, uh, <laughs> exactly. What happens? They don't care. That's the thing. They don't care. This hospital where this doctor has his practice that I met today, it's it's on the out, you know, it's kind of on the edge of a wealthy part of Baltimore City and they want to turn it into just a, a cardiac and orthopedic hospital because that's where all the money is, right? And he's serving Medicaid patients. That's the majority of his practice and they want his floor space. They don't want him there. So they've come up with bogus reasons, you know, to, to kick him out and it's destroying him. He's been, he was born and raised in Baltimore, wanted to serve his community. He's been in the same office for 15 years. So um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens if, but it's this whole situation where, and you know, the medical students just kind of get indoctrinated into this system. Yeah, I didn't really know what was going on when I was in medical school or residency. It, it was when I got out that I saw how the system really functioned because you're just trying to get through medical school and residency, right? And you don't have, at least back when I trained, you know, you were on call every third or fourth night and you didn't even like know what the world looked like or what was going on in it, you know? Yeah. So, um, but there is a growing Students for a National Health Program is really active and they're connecting the issues. Um, so, you know, yeah, I don't know where it's going to go. I think that the specialists are definitely just trying to make as much money as they can. And I think part of that goes to the student debt issue, which yeah. you know, leaves them in a, a really unfair position, too. What's yeah. been bothering me recently is. I'm here with my parents and dad with the Alzheimer's and we watch the state time TV and all these ads for, you know, like alternatives to Medicare. And I'm like, keep your hands off my. Yeah. Just this happened. Away. This happened to us. Uh, my partner, Kevin's uh, father died last year and, and he'd been a retired, he was a retired school teacher. And so Kevin's mom had, you know, her supplemental through his, what? pension thing and original Medicare and we worked really hard to find her a, a good supplemental you know for her original Medicare and then she went to a senior center that she's been wow. going to and uh, and a salesman came in and convinced her to go into Medicare Advantage now she can't see her doctor they don't want to pay for the medicine that she needs yeah. I call New York and they're like that's illegal they're not allowed to go into the senior centers and sell this, but it doesn't doesn't stop them. And now she's totally confused about, sure, you know, the whole thing and doesn't know who to trust because the guy was so nice, you know. It's, <laughs> so it's it's uh yeah, people are afraid of by this system. And the thing about medical school is that the price has gone up so high. I mean, I I went to medical school in the 1980s and I was able to, you know, get loans. I went to a state school, it was $5,000 a year and mm -hmm. I got loans to pay for it. And, um, you know, I came out with, you know, some debt, but I was able to pay it off. Now medical students are coming out with, you know, $150,000, $200,000 worth of debt. Mm -hmm. And so they're driven into the specialties that are actually going to make the money. Primary care doesn't, doesn't pay. So we're losing our primary care docs. And it's also creating this system where really only if people who are elites can afford to go to medical school. So these are not the people that want to go back into their communities and take care of the people in their communities. They're people that want to have the lifestyle that they've been used to having. So just a lot of factors that are at play here. We're very interested in comparing social groups. And uh, you made a, you raised the question earlier of what do we need to do to achieve equity? It would be interesting to see a schema on that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the question whether equity is even enough. You know, yes. that's equity for now versus where we want to get to. Yeah, you know, I see um, getting a national improved Medicare for all system or a national health system. I would, you know, I would support either of those um, as a first step because that. It, gets, it gives you a system, it gives you the money to pay for what you need for, it, and it gives you a way to start looking at, okay, how do we allocate our resources in a more equitable way? Um, what do we need to do in our healthcare system to actually improve the health of our population? It just gives you a structure that allows you then to push for the changes that we need. I mean, we didn't talk about the fact that you know, rural hospitals are closing down, hospitals in low-income communities are closing down, and so the things that we faced 
that blacks faced during the, you know, the, before the civil rights movement, when a black person would go to a hospital and could be bleeding and dying and the hospital would say, we don't serve you. And they would have to get back into their vehicle and try to find some place and maybe die before they get there. Now that's impacting people in low income communities and rural communities are facing the same thing. Not that they're, that they go to the hospital. There's just no hospital there because it's not making enough money. So um, a national improved Medicare for all system would have a, a special budget allocated budget for for the health uh, facilities that we need and every health facility would get a, an operating budget to take care of its community so it wouldn't matter if it was making money or not every month it gets a check to pay for the you know the cost that it has um, so I see this really as a beginning and not at all as an end but I don't think that we can do it there's no way that we can get where we need to go until we take this first step so we're constantly told that we have to compromise for less and the Democrats are floating out all these different confusing options to try to make us do less. And the lesson has got to be of the last hundred years, we can't compromise on these basic things. Dr. Flowers. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I had a question about good people who are for the single payer system, but they feel like it just can't happen. So they spend their time um, advocating for improvements to Obamacare because, you know, they don't want people to lose the services they've gotten. But, you know, I don't feel like that's the right answer, but I get it that they don't want to see people hurting. So they support Obamacare, which unfortunately just gives more money to the, you know, right. the insurance companies. Yeah. And, you know, this is something that's been going on for decades. And it, I mean, it just, it's something that people are used to for some reason, um, you know, that we're told what we can get and we're like, okay, well, we'll just try to make this better. People are so willing to, to compromise. And, and, you know, it's interesting. We, we study social movements, you know, social movement theory, because I'm really interested in how we, how we win these fights. Right. And in, um, in social movement theory, basically what we, the way that you win is when you have a certain percentage of the population mobilized and you have national consensus on an issue. So you have, you know, public support, the public has to recognize that there's a problem. They have to recognize that the current system can't fix the problem. And then they have to build, you know, consensus for a solution that would fix the problem. When it comes to single payer in the United States, we don't have to worry about consensus support for single payer. We're, we're, we've got that. I mean, we could, we could strengthen it. But what we don't have consensus for is that we could win, that people have the power to win these things. And so it's been very frustrating to me for the you know, 15 years that I've been advocating for this to see people not willing to fight because I recognize that when enough of us fight, we actually will win this. And right now we're, just, we're seeing so much more momentum on this issue than before. And the Democrats are feeling very pressured. And so this is a time when we should be escalating. So I'm, I'm not sure how to give people that confidence that we could actually win this and solve the problem for everybody. Um, but I think that's, a, that's a, certainly a task that we have. So uh, who would you say are any champions in political leadership, either on Capitol Hill or a, a state governor or someone? Who can we look to to, to help uh, build, their, build support for that individual and for these for, for this kind of dramatic change it would be necessary. Yeah, so um, you bring up an interesting point, which is that we can't actually do single payer at the state level. So even though there are states who are saying that they're doing single payer Medicare for all at the state level, um, that can't actually be done. And, and that could be a whole nother talk. I've written about it. If you go to Health Over Profit, you can find um, information about that. Um, well, you know, what my experience has been is that we don't really have the, the champion that we need. I mean, Senator Sanders has done a good job of getting out there and talking about Medicare for all. Um, he's definitely energized a lot of people around that. But then the legislation that he introduced was a terrible piece of, of legislation. And I don't support it um, until it gets improved. I can't support it. It doesn't get the profit out. It doesn't cover long-term care. And actually, uh, I think that the transition period that he's put into place uh, is going to undermine the whole system and not even make it achievable. So um, he needs to be pushed, um, although it's been great to have him out, out there as a spokesperson. We lost John Conyers. He had been our longtime advocate in the House for H.R. 676. 
Keith Ellison has taken up HR 676 as a lead sponsor, but he's not a strong lead sponsor. He's not strong on this issue. He's not, um, it's not, it's not something that he feels deeply about as, as deeply as we need him, you know, to feel about. And so even he's going to have to be pushed. The fight we have right now in the house is that Ellison may introduce a bill that's more like Sanders bill than the gold standard HR 676. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can pressure the co-sponsors in the house to stay strong and introduce the strongest bill or a stronger one, but not to weaken it because that puts us in a bad position. Um, so really it, to me, what it is it's, it's it's us. It's our job. Um, we have to change the political culture. We have to make it so that no member of Congress feels like they can get away with not supporting national improved Medicare for all. And we have to be smart enough to recognize that they're going to float out these alternatives that sound like Medicare for all, but they aren't actually Medicare for all. We can't be tricked by those because people got fooled by the public option. Oh. Last go around and, and they were told that's something you can get. It's going to fix the problem, the back door to single payer. It was none of those things. Um, and so that's a that's one of the reasons we created the Health Over Profit campaign was to give people the tools and information to understand and not be fooled by these, these proposals that are coming out now. Um, you know, the Center for American Progress has something called Medicare Extra for All. It's basically just enriching, you know, the Medicare Advantage plans um, and, and making them a more centralized part of our healthcare system. I can't remember who was the member of Congress that's introducing another Medicare buy-in. None of these are going to solve the problem because they leave all the rest of the system intact. Um, and that's, you know, we can't get the savings to cover everybody and we can't get a universal system with those proposals. So, um, so it's really about educating ourselves um, and building, you know, building that political, that political culture. We stopped the Trans-Pacific Partnership that way. We made it so politically toxic that everybody was running away from it by, you know, last election year, 2016. We had to do the same thing with Medicare for All, but we have to make it. It's, it's harder to do the positive, right? It's harder to actually get them to do something positive than it is to stop something bad. So we have a lot of work to do. Anybody else have more questions? Um, I, I would just like to mention that I was re reading an article about the role of John Hopkins in East Baltimore, which really is somewhat questionable. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, I'm a DC native, though I'm out in California now. So I sort of know a little about your city and, and I'm yeah. interested, you know, Hopkins wants to make it into the new Silicon Valley or something. And how, yeah, how do you Hopkins feel about is, that and what impact is it having on disadvantaged communities? Yeah, so I actually, I did my residency at, at Hopkins um, and Hopkins is the largest employer in Baltimore City. They own a lot of the city and they are taking over, you know, the low income communities. They're gentrifying all those areas. You probably know that uh, what the area is called Middle East. When I was in residency, you know, we had a primary care pediatric clinic right there in the hospital. We treated a lot of the community members. They, their community started literally across the door from the hospital. Sometimes we would go to their houses, right, and knock on them and you know, say, what's up? And, uh, and they kicked all of those out and created, you know, this uh, I don't even know what it's, it's now they have like chain stores there and, and apartment buildings and things like that. Um, they're doing the same thing to the public housing right around that. We, I work with people in Perkins and um, Pleasant, uh, Pleasant View Gardens and Douglas Homes, which is very close to Hopkins. And they're basically, the residents there think that maybe they have like a year left before they're going to be kicked out and, and there's not going to be any place for them to go. The city is not going to find new housing for them, but they're doing all sorts of things, harassing them. Um, they took away the child care center. There was a child care center there that had been there for more than 20 years that took care of infants to teenagers from early in the morning till late at night. And um, the city took it away, gave it to a nonprofit for a dollar to do a Head Start program from nine to 12 for infants only that's gonna serve basically the Hopkins community. Oh. And so a lot of these families that uh, rely on assistance 
have to have childcare or they can't show up for the programs that they have to show up for in order to qualify for their assistance. I mean, it's just really disgusting. And um, I mean, there's lots of stories. We fought even just to get an election at Douglas Home so they would have a resident advisory board person at the housing authority. Mm. They did everything they could to prevent there from even being an election. And even the day of the election, they tried to stop the person who was the best person because they knew that she was gonna, she was smart and she was gonna go to those meetings and she was gonna know what was going on. So they tried to kick her off the ballot even the day of the election. Mm. And we had to go down to the housing authority and yell and scream at them, just, you know, and show them that we had pictures and documentation of what was being done uh, to get them to even allow that election to go forward. So it's just really disgusting and, you know, this is all part and of it. And I, you know, I, I worked for 27 years for VA and ever since Reagan, uh, they've been trying to contract out as much of VA as possible. We yeah. really do have a medical, it's not just military industrial complex, we have a medical industrial Absolutely. complex. Absolutely. I think we need to be asking questions beyond the obvious ones about pharmacy and insurance companies and that sort of thing. I think the whole system needs some sort of dramatic revamping. Absolutely. So. And there's a group called Right to Heal, which is a veterans group that's forming to prevent, to fight privatization of the VA. And they're single payer supporters. So, um, you know, we're trying to, to build bridges with them as well. Excellent. I thank you very much for coming and sharing all of your wisdom and experience. It's been very enlightening. Um, and it's eight o'clock, so you probably have things to do, and, and I'm eating a late dinner, which it's eight o'clock here. So I'm going to go for that. Any more questions for, before I hang up? I just urge you to check out healthoverprofit.org, um, sign up for the email blast. And we do educational calls twice a month. Um, they're all recorded. So if you miss one, you can go back and listen to them. Um, but it's really uh, a website that was created to give people the tools and information that they need for this fight. And we're of service, in service to the movement, movement. So if there are materials that you need that you don't see, let us know. We'll try to create them. And we'll have the webinar you've just experienced on uh, UUJ. It'll be on our, our website. Great, right. and you have the also, PowerPoint. Let me just mention uh, Popular Resistance, which Margaret and Kevin run and have a multitude of campaigns, including the Flush the TPP campaign and oh, uranium mining and all sorts of progressive, wonderful action. So thank you both. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well great, it was nice to spend time with you. Thanks for okay. having me. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye.